Um, yeah, so hello everyone. Uh, my name is Sergey. Well, it does. I'm not touching that, but yeah. slideshow not 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 the good option so for here. If if you speak fast, then that could be better opportunity for you to just you know do elevator pitch presentation. So that was actually a very lucky moment for me because. Um, Today in Atlanta is happening a big smart cities expo. And um, so we were traveling with, with my colleague Ali, who is, who is sitting there with, uh, with camera, uh, on a purpose to visit that, uh, that meetup, that conference, and see a lot of like robotic stuff, self-driving cars, many, many, many other things. And then I, when I searched events that, that happening in town at the same time, see, ah, there is a Ruby meetup. And, I, I run Ruby meetups in, in Belarus, and I was like, hey, let's, let's, you know, step by, let's see what's happening. And Ali said, no, like, we're going to have, like, tight schedule, there is no time. And so this conference um, actually uh, was a disaster because, like, today, and we, we spent just one day. It's going to be happening the whole week, like, three more days. And we came there, and it's empty. There is nothing. So they, they announced the day. But it was actually the day for you know unboxing all this stuff. So we've seen a lot of you know boxes, a lot of stuff, but no people and no chance to talk to anybody. And so it turns that because we we, we are leaving uh, tomorrow in the morning, so we, we don't have a chance to catch up with the falls with the robots. So this event is the major event, the major purpose for for us to be here. So I will try to do my best <laughs> to uh, to report back to to my company. <laughs> <laughs> that we didn't fail the, the business trip agenda. So <laughs> thank you very much for having me here. Without you, we, we would pay uh, for this trip on our own. <laughs> we are safe. Um, so I contacted Rias, and, um, and I talked like, hey, we, we're running some funny stuff with community in Belarus. And, um, and I wanted to share something. It is not always obvious that, like, you do community here, you, uh, you support each other, share your knowledge. That's the purpose for community to exist. Uh, like this one that you've done recently, like who is looking for jobs, who is hiring. I never seen that before. It's a very cool practice, and I believe we can use that when I get back to, to Minsk. But we do education and community more. And uh, the purpose that I wanted to show you one of the projects that we run as part of our community. And uh, we've been doing that three years. And at the moment, we have some funny results which I wanted to share to you. So uh, a couple of words about myself. I, I am a founder of Belarus Ruby user group. So you have Atl Rook acronym. We have Brook, Belarus Ruby user group. And uh, Brook, we also, you can find is Belgium Ruby user group, so we're fighting for the domain name. So uh, Brug in, in, in Belgium means the bridge. And so actually, uh, we now at the moment, so are fighting for the domain name. We, we think that we both different parts of the bridge. So they are Brug in Belgium. We are Brug in Belarus. So that, that was the, the deal. And um, the project that I'm going to talk to you, uh, it is actually community school that we are hosting in, inside of Brook, inside of our community. Um, this is the reason for us to pay off for the, for the business trip. So I say many thanks to our companies who pay for our tickets here. So Cybergizer and Robots Network. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, this is for recording. So done. <laughs> um, that is interesting because when I tell Belarus, uh, not always people understand where is that. Some of them, uh, you know, tell that yeah, yeah, I know that it was part of Russia, which is definitely not uh, like saying like oh, this is white Russia. So either if you translate that literally, that that can potentially mean that. So when I explain where is Belarus, I usually say like everybody knows Russia, everybody knows uh, where is China. So I usually say like. Russia is located between Belarus and China. So that's, that's the reason how to, how to explain that. And um, so we are from Minsk. Minsk is the capital of Belarus. And it's 5,000 miles. If you figure out how, like, uh, maybe it is obvious. Uh, but if you open the map, 
and you, you can measure the distance between two cities, you would draw a, a line, like direct line, which is not correct. And because when you see, if you want to fly to Europe, you, you're going to fly over the Iceland, or over the Greenland and the Iceland then. So that's the route which we made to, to get here to Atlanta with a couple of, uh, with a couple of stops. And um, in Belarus, we, we have uh, not only one community. I don't know if you guys have different meetups or different community groups in Ruby, but we do. Like, we have Brook as the one and the first one community. It was started almost 10 years back. And uh, on the first meetup, we have, like, 10 people who gathered. And me and, and my good friend, we explained what is Ruby and what is Rails. We have just two topics to, to explain. And after that, uh, community in, like, overall in... Um, in Belarus and in Minsk, it's 2,000 and a half engineers total. So the, our population, it's increasing, and we have more people who speak Ruby. And, uh, and uh, after some time, we, we created a new community, which we called Minsk.rb. So how do we separate that? So those two communities, more like, most likely like community for old school, with uh, topics and people who we invite to come. Uh, usually it is stars from, from Ruby and Rails. And means.rb, it's more like, uh, like this event. We, we, we have beer, we have pizza, and we do pretty much the same what you do here, guys. But what we have, and I think what is unique and what I'm going to talk about, we created like four, three years back, we created new community just for juniors. Because when junior guys come to you know, mature Ruby meetup and they, uh, they hear about GraphQL, they hear about performance optimization, they, people talk about some cool stuff, they just don't understand what's happening. And the reason for them to come is just to have pizza and beer, but they don't get any kind of a knowledge. No use for them to, you know, to listen to people. So, and uh, that was the, like, the first goal. We created community for young people. And I think this is what you guys also do because you like, try to educate people, you do workshops. Um, we wanted to have it like, in a format of open microphone. So anybody can come explain topics. Sometimes it's obvious topics, like how to set up Postgres or uh, how do I do with device, how to work with any kind of API and so on and so forth. <clears throat> and my, my personal proud is that we, we host RubyConf in Minsk, that was the first like big and international event that we managed to brought to the country. And we've been doing that like four or five years uh, in a row. And um, the next thought that came to us that um, in order to evolve our community, to bring new people, to bring like fresh blood, uh, we need to help people to educate. But we don't have like, if for example, I want to teach people, it is only me, like one too many. I can bring something, I can try to you know, share, but I cannot scale myself. Like I cannot make a copy of myself to let people you know, ask more questions for me to do like code reviews and so on and so forth. And we, we start looking how to make this community education to run more independently and to, uh, to run itself. And we came to School 42. I don't know if you guys heard about that. Um, it is idea for people, I think it Google first announced that, that all you have to do is just to create environment and let people uh, just be part of that environment. And they can figure out how to learn, how to get practice, how to manage, like self-organize themselves in projects and work on, within those projects. So this new way of study, which is called community-driven education, there is no teachers, there is no curriculum, there is nothing, <clears throat> if you can imagine this place, that is open 24-7. People come here, they can talk to each other, they can share their problems, and they can find people who know how to solve their problems. This is the way that we decided to pilot. So what we've done, um, we created Rubitsa uh, Survival Camp. So Rubitsa, it is Ruby plus pizza. And uh, we say, hey, we know guys, like, we know, guys, how to, how to make you happy. We don't know how to teach you, but we try our best to connect you with people who know. And, um, 
and we have pizza. So at least you, you be, uh, you'll not be hungry. <clears throat> we found a couple of companies who needed junior developers who were really looking for higher talents. And they do that constantly. And we say, hey, this summer, it was the first season, we can pilot a Ruby school. At the end of this Ruby school, you, you, will, you will be able to hire new students for you, like new employees potential. But we need to hire a facility. We need to hire an office. Can you pay us money upfront so we can hire a facility? And then you will be able to hire somebody who will graduate from our, our school. And we were lucky that a few companies say, OK, go ahead. Go and find venue that you'd like. And uh, the purpose for us that this venue is open 24 to 7. So it's like, we're going to use it as a hackathon, but for two months. So we're going to open everything. There is nothing but internet, uh, whiteboards, markers, and so on and so forth. Um, after running two, uh, two or three those runs, um, we were managed to you know, find people who supported us. And um, at the moment, we have the school running in two cities, in, in Minsk and in St. Pete, for four seasons. Uh, sorry, this slide should be at the end, but <laughs> it turns to be here. Um, and then the last point that we needed is to bring the idea for this course. And we thought that um, how to build school that is uh, unique, something that nobody does, because there is code school, code academy, a lot of different you know, online, offline resources, franchises that, uh, that gives you like brilliant materials great curriculums, everything that you need to, you know, to become a Ruby engineer. And we decided that we're going to be really tough. So because we, we didn't have budget, we, we didn't have enough chairs, actually, fairly speaking. So we have limited number of chairs that we managed to, to rent for that facility. But we have beautiful facility. So we said, it's going to be survival camp. So it's going to be tough. So because we don't have enough chairs, then we're going to kick out some people who were low performance. So we're going to be tough. And those who survive, we will guarantee them job. And uh, we, we have, like, every time we have different season with different, um, different style. This year, we have Tarantinos. So the idea is that we kidnap you into the trunk. And uh, if you survive, then out from this trunk, you get to your uh, new office with a laptop and computer, and you start coding in Ruby. So that, that was the idea. So. Um, because we were playing this game, and we wanted to make it tough, we say, like, let's, make, let's take more people and put a little bit pressure. So uh, like this year, we had 520 people who nominated themselves. To be selected to the course, uh, we created like an API that you need to hack. So it's like a simple API. If you figure out how to hack it, you can get access to the database. In the database, you find your application. And in the field approved, uh, you say yes or true. So then, ba-bam, you are part of the, uh, of the school. Uh, and um, 520 we had, only 120, like almost 400 people didn't manage to hack our API. But 100 managed to do. And, uh, and we invited all of them to become to the, to the training center with not enough chairs. So 30% of them usually decide to get out after two weeks because they think like it is not education at all. Like what, what are you guys, you are not educating us. It is just facility and chairs <laughs> and pizza sometimes. So how, how would we learn Ruby just being here? <clears throat> but another 30%, we, we actually do them tasks. So from the first day, we give them practical tasks. So they, they, they start with uh, Ruby coins, then they do Sinatra application, then they do chatbots. So simple but valuable tasks. And we don't, we don't give them any theory at all. So at the first day, you have your task, how to create a Sinatra application. If anybody in the room managed to create that, he should spare, share this knowledge to everybody. And so they like, like a virus. Sinatra virus is going into the, uh, into the room. So now everybody knows how to deal with Sinatra. So if there is tasks that they cannot solve, then we ask people from the community. Because we have like many people in the community say, hey, can anybody come and explain how to work with Sinatra? Because we have 50 people who are struggling with Sinatra like 48 hours. 
And somebody from community come and say, hey, what do you have, like, guys? You have particular questions, and they have dozens of particular questions. And so then they explain how to do that properly. And that's actually the way of education. So they try, they fail, and then when they get people who knows how to do that right, this loop is connected. So when they get the right answer, they will, they'll, they will for, remember that like forever. And the message that we have, everybody at the end who survive, they will get a job offer guarantee. So it's hard. Many people stay like 16 hours a day in the, in the camp. And um, how do we make this work? How do we make, we, we make this, this message? Because we are nonprofit at all. Like we were not making any money off it. So we have people who are doing hacking two months. Like summertime, some of them almost leave in, inside of this, uh, this you know, venue in the building. So company can, it's open doors. So companies who are hiring, they can go to the training anytime. They can send their mentors and they can spend two months shoulder to shoulder to people who work. So they are not actually hiring, they testing people. So if you see that they can bring some uh, food, they can bring some projects, they can bring some ideas, they can explain any problems that they have. And so they see people who, you know, interested in what those companies are doing. For example, somebody from FinTech, they can come and say, hey, I have like open source API. Anybody keen to take a look and contribute? Like do simple tasks. And if they have people, those two months, it's like a trial period for them. So at the end, if people survive, they immediately get a job. And the idea that we didn't know how to educate at all, so, and we, we just have venue, but we managed to have uh, more mentors and trainers and people who want to contribute than people who want to educate. And so this is like a very interesting idea that when you, at the same place, uh, when you put people who want to learn and you have community, you will find people who want to teach who want to grow, who want to harden their soft skills, who want to practice their leadership. So they come to this training as a sandbox and they play a role of a, like scrum master, tech leaders, and we let them do that. We let them experiment. And, uh, and this is like the, the, we merge the group, of, the group of people where both of them benefit. We also let companies in and we ask them, hey, if you have any projects, give it to us. We don't promise that you, we, we will give you any feasible outcome, but we try. At least we will try. We, we can try to solve you some problems. Uh, at, at the very first lunch, one of the company who gave us project was um, Pizza House. And they said, hey, we need to have a new internet, uh, internet website to order pizza. If you can build us a pizza constructor, we will like, we will provide you as many pizza as you need. It's a great deal. And like, we, we, br we brought that to, to the training, say, who likes pizza? Who want to code for pizza? And we have like a group of five people, like, we do code for pizza. And they implemented them website. And we like, we've had like more 200 pizzas like for the whole summer. Pizza was good, but at the end, nobody would, would, would order pizza like for six months in, up front. So different companies, some of them want to hire, some of them want to just pilot something. Sometimes the startups come, come to us. And that's what we do. And um, people, like the schedule for the training, 24-7 is open, five days they work, as many hours as they can. Saturday, we invite community to come, like people from community to come and host event. Hackathon, Hacking Night, Code Katas, we do Code Enjoy, we've done Code Retreat, We've done different events, so when people come, they try to, like those two groups, and this is how we actually grow community. People from community who are already Rubyists, they come to us and then people who want to become Ruby engineers, they see, uh, you know, they are potential peers. So they drink beer, they solve some puzzles, and it is always fun, and it works great. So Sunday, it is usually, uh, you know, time off, and everybody you know, needs to have a, sleep death. Um, and uh, our idea was actually successful. So usually, if like this, this year, 500 people submitted, 
100 people passed coding quests and hugged the API. Then 80 people were invited to the training. 40 people survived. And right next to the, like the, the, the first September, majority of those, of those people got their job, uh, job offers. Because company who seen that those guys are really struggling, they overcome, they try to solve problems, they almost you know, live in the, in the training center, all those characteristics are good for them. And for people, when, when you know exactly it's gonna be hard for you two months, but at the end you get a job, this is something that, that you, you decide, okay, I'm gonna contribute to two months of my life, but I will get a job, and this is something that could be a good fast track for me. So um, I'm happy to share you guys all the materials that we have and answer all the questions, but the, the main message for this presentation is that if you don't do education, if you don't have fresh blood and, and new people who come to the technology, to Ruby, there is no chance for us to survive. To, to keep community running, we need to have fresh blood, so don't be lazy. Think about how you can help your peers, and education could be fun. This is just about for you and your creativity. So thank you very much, and if you have any questions, this is, you can check uh, the, all, everything that is happening, including training materials uh, at Rubitsa, or you know, pull me over and ask me if you have. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, does the program run, uh, run year round? Uh, or is it only for the summer? <laughs> no, we, we actually run summer seasons because uh, a lot of students come to us and it's hard sometimes for them to you know, make it along with their studies. So usually summertime is vacation. For those people who want to shift like from, from any other technology, summer is also a good time. Um, so it's three months actually that we run, summertime also, yeah. We've done that for two cities this year, so it's Minsk in Belarus and St. Pete in Russia. Uh, so if you want to run it next year, I'm happy to share you everything. Uh, you have this beautiful facility, it's good enough. Not that perfect because after, after three months, it's gonna be ruined mostly because people, when they self-organize, there's like a lot of boxes, a lot of trash, stickers everywhere. So, but yeah, it's, it's easy to run, so if you'd like, uh, we don't think about it as a franchise. Anybody can do that. Because okay. I was thinking um, if I could help uh, students online because I'm having some issues at school and if I may not be able to continue going to college because of some mechanical issues that caused all my uh, reports for NIN to not be graded, there my GPA dropped from 3 point something to 2 point something again. Can I be able to continue in school? So if work comes to show, how So if you, <clears throat> if you actually, uh, you know, want to contribute or do something in terms of, you know, mentoring or uh, something that you can share, uh, you guys run workshops, right? It's a it's great opportunity for anybody to ask, hey, uh, I've done very cool stuff at my work. Like, I've implemented super duper cool API that talks to GraphQL and uses Elixir, whatever. Uh, I want to come and teach how, how I've made it. So, and uh, like Riaz, can you order some pizza or anything just to make, make sure like everybody uh, should come and listen to me and that, that's, that's easy to do. Uh, yeah. I was gonna ask, uh, so you chose to make, for lack of a better term, the, the culture be a little brutal. Like people come in, it's really hard work. You know, you get weeded out quickly. And in the Ruby community, often we want to be a lot more welcoming and friendly. Absolutely. And lifting for people who might struggle. Is there Our is that more like why why did y'all choose to be? Do you have internet here? So um, it is it. super brutal. And our, could you open an internet, please? Um, so it is super brutal, and our community, absolutely the same as you described. Everybody, so like if you go here, so we wanted to create something that is absolutely doesn't look like anything that exists in the community. So it was, we, we call that Ruby Princesses. 
So everybody who is a Ruby senior, they are princesses. They are so unique, so rare, so highly paid. So, and all the community that we have, we treat that very well. And we wanted to have this training absolutely in opposite manner to what you have in a community. <clears throat> so for example, so our community is 10 years old. And uh, when I invite people, people ask, is there anybody, you know, stars who are coming to events? Like, is, is there anybody guests who are coming from other countries? So we will go to the community and see something new because we are so bored to see like local folks. We see them all the time, so we are not going to go. And in this case, um, the idea to be very tough was that, uh, first of all, it's a game. When you invite people to come, and uh, even it's free, so the course is free, education is free, how would you kick somebody out? How would you fire somebody, say, hey, you, now you go. You're not staying with us because you are a low performer. There is no chance because people is go, like, they feel that personally. Feel like, huh? And, 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 yeah, and when they left, they, they will feel bad. When you have this game, and it works for everybody. Like we have the, 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 the senior person in the camp with absolute power. So for example, in the morning, uh, everybody should appear. And, um, and they do self-service everything. So they need to you know, keep trash, trash out. So we, we didn't have cleaners at the first time. So they, they have to clean after themselves. And for example, if somebody like, or the, the head of the camp uh, appeared in the morning and there is trash, he can fire anybody, like you out. Because like, it's like an army, it's very tough. But, and and we, we fire a lot of people. Like if you can imagine we have like 80, 40 at the end, so 40, 40 people were out. Uh, so we needed to have a game and we needed to have very brutal game. And those guys who decided like first two weeks, people, didn't have their names, so they use numbers. And we say, we, we tell them like, we don't want to remember your names because half of you will be out after two weeks. So you will deserve or you will receive your name only after two weeks. So this is kind of a, it's, sometimes it's ridiculous, but people like it, you know? Yeah, people like it. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. Actually, we have we have. Um, let me see if I open that now. We have a curriculum, and um, even though we say there is no curriculum, there is curriculum, and uh, but we don't force anybody to walk through all those topics. So if everybody understands Ruby basics we don't teach them Ruby basics because they teach themselves how to deal with classes, how to deal with variables, with everything. So we don't know what is the average level of the group, so we dynamically keep the bar high. Every time that you know, we challenge themselves, they figure out. If they don't, then we, we do have all materials and we actually, so what we created for these three, three years, we have every, like every single point here, we have video recording, so everybody who wants to teach a particular topic, he get like speaker notes, he get video from, uh, from the past, uh, past courses. So everybody from the community can prepare themselves before the, the actual lecture. I think definitely see the benefits. I mean, it's a lot like self-learning, which, you know, even graduating with a CS degree can be the science. A lot yeah. of what you're doing is self-learning. It's, uh, it's uh, I guess, a test of discipline. Discipline is very important because uh, I don't know how it's here, guys, but for example, uh, we have very flexible schedule. For example, if you work, you can appear, uh, you know, in the office, like 10 a.m., 11 a.m., sometimes 12 a.m., like in noon. And uh, for most of the companies, it doesn't matter. So if you do your job well, so if you come later, then you stay later. And uh, for example, in my team, uh, it was a problem to gather people on the stand-up. Because if we want to do stand-up early in the morning, some of the people don't show up. Like, 
because they are late and so on and so forth. So discipline is very important, especially for juniors. When you're a senior, that's okay. You can run on your own. But when, when you need to communicate with other people a lot, that's, that's important. Yeah. So, see, w once again, yeah, like any, any, like anything creative you, you did to spread the awareness of like growing this friend community, like, you um, know, yeah. So we we actually started with a small group of people because it was mostly experiment, and uh, and after those people who were kicked off. Uh, their friends and friends of their friends, right after the first run, uh, they submitted their application for the next one, like for the next year. And uh, this year, we, we had our group completed in like three, four days. So we didn't advertise it. We didn't do actually anything. But I think the, the main, like the key point here to make this program successful, that if you survive, you get a job. No interviews. Nothing more, it's going to be hard. You survive, you get a job. That's pretty simple. Because nobody else, I don't know any other school that can guarantee you that. So how we do that, we invite companies uh, to be committed. So we don't, like, we don't position ourselves as like hiring agency or whatever, or like just a regular school. So when we talk to companies, we say to them, if you want to like, hire people, you need to contribute. And your contribution is first, like, we have, we have to run this facility, so we have some kind of a budget, so we need money to survive for us. Second, uh, we need your employees to come to our camp, do code review, and help us to run that, along with, you know, all people from community. So, and, um, and as we have, like, constant demand on the market, like, we have dozens of Ruby positions that are open, and people not enough there, so, you know, if you know exactly that if after two months uh, you will pick up this new technology on a very basic level, but enough for you to, to start doing that on like production side, you get a job, then you, you will nominate yourself like two months, hard working, but yeah. I think it's average and pretty much the same. We, we had a conversation with Rias yesterday. And um, I think the situation with Atlanta and in Minsk pretty much the, the same because like trends of Ruby running in circles. Uh, now we have new age and uh, it's, it's getting more and more open positions for Ruby. I don't know why. Maybe because of startups again. Maybe because of something that people decide to do. Um, along with Ruby, I see that Elixir is getting more uh, kind of a popularity. Python because of AI and ML and, and so on. So um, yeah, I, I think startups and products decide to use Ruby once again because of uh, you know low level, like low threshold for people to get in. Easy to switch people from other technology and then easy to switch them back. For example, if you start with Ruby, it's easy for you to switch to Python or to Elixir. And along with Ruby, if you can do like React and you can like in a couple of years become full stack engineer, that's it, like, that's a good combination for, for you as a startup to, to build like, like completely independent team. But a couple of years back, we, we had topics in media that Ruby is dead. I don't know if you guys have the similar, had similar, but yeah, but we had like, top ratings of, uh, of languages, of programming languages. And uh, like one day we figure out there is no Ruby. Like, what? Like, what's happened? And we had a couple of like very popular podcasts and they said like, it looks like Ruby is dead. And it's going to be a very popular thread. Like everybody said, hey, Ruby is dead. Like Ruby is dead. Like nobody is going to learn Ruby. And we wanted to have like official, you know, funeral ceremony for Ruby, but <laughs> didn't make it work. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, still, um, I don't know what's, like, Stripe. It's, it's taking over as well, like, Shopify 
done a lot in actually like Active Merchant and a lot of stuff that was implemented as, as part of. Uh, just recently switched to JavaScript, but for a while I was still. Yeah. Um, Ember GS, I don't know if anybody is still doing that, but that was a really good catch some time ago before like Angular and, uh, and React. Uh, but yeah, everything is changing. I, I, like, I don't think like JavaScript, like, because it's changing so, so fast, uh, it's those people who decide like, I will learn JavaScript and, and only, uh, they have to you know, learn something new every second year because every new framework appears in everything that was like, do you know like MarioNet framework? From never heard, like this is Backbone and Marionette. It was super popular, like Backbone was the first one. Then uh, if you miss that, then Angular. Now nobody cares about Angular, that we can react. Yeah. Then Dart and Flutter, and you know like something will happen in the next year, uh, who knows. Uh, Sure, yeah. But like seriously, for a lot of things, like a boring Rails 6 application, like truly, like Web 2.0 is probably better for many of these apps than putting them on the shifting sands of the JavaScript ecosystem. Uh, I agree. I mean, I tried building a, a Node.js app for somebody, but the like, mandate it had a Node.js, and I had to update Node.js like five times and almost It is actually a very good point about like keeping on updates. And uh, if you do like microservices now and everybody's happening like microservices, it's like server bullet, silver bullet. You can solve everything. Like if you have a monolith, let's split it up, let's use microservices. But nobody knows what's happening with microservices in like three years, four years. I, I've got my like one of the, my applications that I implemented like seven years back. I got it like last year to, to fix the bug, to maintain it. It was Rails 2, and I've seen like it was working all the time, and uh, nobody like ever updated that. Yeah. It was good enough, right? Yeah, so. It was good. Jenkins, you know, um, static 
type generator using Ruby or something, yeah. and only use the, the microservice architecture, we actually need to. Does microservices architecture is the greatest architecture ever until you go to deploy it and maintain it. Uh, then it all falls. <laughs> from, a, yeah, from a performance standpoint, it's great, it's fast. And then it's the horizontal scaling. So does Brian Mullen and Steve Clark or Go and use a monolith architecture. I mean, it's <laughs> yeah, like before, before the microservices, uh, MVC framework was just awesome. Like, like, you know, Rails appeared and everybody said, that's, you know, now everything is going to be differently. And uh, now is microservices taking over. I, I bet, like, after the microservices, it's going to be like plain file with plain text with no highlights because, like, it's easy to read and easy to, you know, evaluate them. And uh, we're going like in circles and we are getting back to the same idea that was in PHP like 15 years back. No, no, like, no MVCs, no many files, like just one file that is easy to implement. You just put it into the bare metal server with no like interpreter, with no operation system and like, you know, bare metal can, imp you know, execute your file. And everybody would, would love to use that, so. Sure, yeah, no, no. The biggest thing in technology, we think of technology, but for the people we work with, the, the single largest expense in their technology is our time. And so when you make something complicated, if you're at the scale of Facebook where you literally cannot physically buy enough servers and rack them fast enough in your cloud data center, you may have a computer science problem. Most of the people we work with can trivially just use more hard, like faster computers, more hardware to solve whatever little pit squeak scaling problem you think you have, and you are optimized for working on the most valuable thing for your business in code instead, with that time that is vastly more precious, and they can't afford another developer. Maybe they only have one or two. Or maybe they're a little bit more, but they can't afford to grow scale in that way. They can def they may not like it that their AWS bill is gonna be twelve hundred dollars instead of eleven hundred dollars, but they can afford that versus you going down the wrong path like with the tech stack. Okay, I'll get off the mic. Yeah, so that's that's a beautiful idea. Uh, you're paid for yeah, that's just we are gonna rub up, yeah. So you you are paid for like you get money for writing code faster or for writing code that work faster. Like, this is the idea. If you can faster solve business problem, then your, you know, your company saves money, actually. If you uh, implement code, and take, it takes a long time, but the code is like perfect, who knows, right? So if you implement like very complex architecture and solution, but your, you know, your product is gonna be out of the market in the next like six months, who cares? But yeah, sorry for. Just give me one final question. Okay. One final question. So, um, how, how how satisfied are the companies that are funding your um, school? Uh, how satisfied are they? They're the ones that are employing your uh, people that are coming through the Columbine. How, like, what's the retention rate of the companies? Like, how often do they come back every year, every single time? Or do you get um, fresh blood? As you say? Yeah. So we actually. Um, you know, try to get feedback from people and from companies to, to understand, you know, happy they are or not. Uh, the, first, the first KPI that I can, can bring that 100% of people pass their trial. So we usually have, based on the contract, like three months trial. So you, when you hired, like you have three months and uh, your employer can, you know, can fire you without any, like, reason. Like, you're performing badly, so fire. 100% people pass. Um, after one year, uh, nobody changed their job. So everybody, so the people stayed at the company at least one year after graduation. Uh, after a year, they can change the place because, you know, they don't like a project, they don't like, like, or they grow so fast and they want more challenges. So I wouldn't say like 
what is the like retention rate or uh, how to keep that. But companies like if retention rate for the companies, then uh, I think we got more companies than we need this year. I would say like that way. And that's the reason for us to, you know, to spread the word and uh, find other communities who want to write, run the same concept. So um, we don't actually, like for ourselves, we don't position that as a junior developers uh, who, are, who are graduates because they don't actually like junior engineers because they don't have real experience, even though they can code. We, we tell that they are like top 2% of talented juniors. So it's like you are junior engineer like juniors. And um, I can tell you that everybody, so many of companies have their own boot camps. So when you, when you get a job, it could be from one up to two months for your orientation, internal trainings, and mentoring. So when you're hired as a junior, company invests their time and efforts to get you up to speed. So, so you pass the boot camp. So our people, when they get hired, uh, they don't need those boot camps. So those companies who have it, they skip it and they let people just, you know, on board, like after orientation, they just get into the teams and work like as, you know, uh, regular engineers. And um, the, the satisfaction le level for people who graduate, uh, almost everybody, like we have four runs, and uh, this current run that we had, we have, uh, we had like almost 10 people who nominated themselves as volunteers to contribute back to our school. So they get back as a mentor. So they say, we, we're ready to help. So we feel like we, we need to contribute back to community to help new people who come. So, and it's actually started running in circles. So if we step out, all we need to have is, you know, Venue, room, and somebody to bring pizza. So, and it can, you know, make themselves work. So, <laughs> again, thank you very much, guys. And um, if you have questions, like, catch me here. And uh, have a great uh, evening. Thank you. <laughs>